Good evening, and welcome to the You Talk Show. And I get to say that again for a change, so that our glorious friend Kyle here with the luscious locks can get a little bit of a break for his throat. So we're continuing just this week. Um, previously, our we've final talked part about the presumption of. Hmm? Our yeah. final part, yeah. I believe. Previously, we've discussed the presumption of innocence, uh, the standard of evidence, the um, the way the courts operate, and, and the various legal strategies for avoiding speeding tickets. <laughs> I am not a lawyer. This is absolutely legal advice. Don't commit crimes. <laughs> <clears throat> um. The last Good question advice. we have is the last question we have ultimately is why don't people get jailed? Why do people get jailed? How do we decide the punishments that we meet out? And mm -hmm. what happens when everyone knows someone's guilty and yet they walk? Yeah. Kyle? Well, yeah, ultimately when and why do we imprison people? Being my yep. absolutely, uh, I don't know whether to say glorious, wonderful, or terrible, but maybe it's a mix of all three, um, but being myself in the way that I am, I am already getting super philosophical about this and thinking, well, there's essentially kind of three, three reasons that we imprison people, or at least there should be three reasons, um, or perhaps not. Let's examine. So there's, there's rehabilitation. There's the mm -hmm. removal of dangerous elements from society. And then Absolutely. there's punitive action. You know, when like when is it okay that we're just punishing people? When it is a when should we be trying to rehabilitate people? And when when is it essentially a lost cause and we just need to conclude that we need to remove that dangerous person from society? Those are all questions that come to mind. Yes. What do you think, Boss? Well, in a moral sense, you're correct. Um, the reasons that we imprison people are rehabilitation, keeping society safe, and uh, um, punishing them. Legally, it's a little bit different, uh, but I'd like to start with the moral side of this because it is actually, as I've said multiple times, the laws have to reflect what society considers acceptable and unacceptable. Otherwise, they aren't mm. useful. So, it's something that we don't really talk about, but the public needs to perceive that a person has suffered for doing the wrong thing. Um, it is about satisfying a societal demand for justice. Um, when we look at rehabilitation and um, removal well, from actually, society... Before we, before we do, question on that. Because that's that's kind yeah. of when when you say you know justice there and society needs to perceive that someone has been punished enough. I mean, part of part of my I guess you know sort of sagely idea of it is like, well, is that really justice or just vengeance? Is it is it both? Like, well, I mean, so remember, you know, what I, is I? I guess I referred previously to the to the saying, "I've done my time. I've paid my debt to society." Hmm. Um, part of justice is um, oh, contrition. Part of hmm. part of the justice process, whether that is a um. A judicial process, whether that is part of um, a custodial sentence or being sentenced to do community service, for instance, is the idea that to counterbalance the harm that you have done with your crime, you are going to do some good. You are going to repay what you have done. And in certain cases, for instance, well, for murder, keep coming back to murder, you can't really repay the cost of a person's life, but if you can demonstrate a certain level of um, 
contrition by accepting accepting that there is a consequence and that's psychologically very important i guess whether or not it's um just vengeful punishments or whether or not it's um a a i guess for lack of a better term the inducing of of justice i guess in that regard it kind of gets determined by the individual who is being punished you know do they ex i mean essentially it's asking do they accept that what they did was wrong and do they feel remorse for it but then again, okay so here's a question here's a and this again <laughs> sorry to get so philosophical but here's a question i think no, I'm just going yeah. to say that previous if... question covers something which I was intending to cover anyway, because that is where we look at the legal concept of deterrence. So please ask your True. question. This is this well, is all to according ask... to Keikaku. <laughs> yeah. mm, okay. Um, <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> we, we both know where we got that from. Um, but anyway, so the question that, that came... That, it came to my mind was what if say there you know debts to, to society that was paid was say five years and but afterwards they didn't feel remorse they didn't feel um any kind of contrition they didn't accept that what they did was wrong you know they're entirely sort of i don't know self-centered about it or you know they i guess arrogant and, and narcissistic about it you know, they, I mean, they served the five years. They, quote, unquote, paid their debt to society, but... But they may not learn they, from it. Yeah, they haven't learned from it. So what then? What would constitute justice in that situation? Okay. I'm asking a pretty tough question, aren't I? No, that's okay. Um, We're going to have to... Mm. Ooh. <sighs> I know, I'm getting really I was just cross referencing. I was just cross referencing the sentencing acts for New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, you'll see why. Okay. I would argue that for someone who cannot accept culpability, for someone who cannot accept criminal responsibility, there can never be justice. But I would also argue that such people are, in fact, few and far between. Most people who commit True. a crime of a magnitude that we would consider to be unquestionably a crime don't really want to do it again. Um, there are frequently circumstances that have driven them to that, and they often retain a, a psychological element of guilt. The... The hardened criminal who is doing absolutely everything to weasel out of responsibility is a very good staple for dramatic TV watching. But in reality, those hardened criminals are exceptionally rare. Hmm. And the punitive um, action, but... would you say that, you know, if done right is enough of a deterrence? I guess if properly considered is enough of a deterrence. You know, we've discussed how so, the legal system works here's the fun and bit. how it evolves. Would you say that the evidence is, it... is divided? Oh, okay. So there, there's, there there's is a big, not a consensus on that. Ah, uh, yeah, we need we need to talk about deterrence. We we need yeah. to talk about deterrence now. We cannot go further without talking about deterrence. And um, when we look at sentencing, um. In Victoria, we're looking at the Sentencing Act 1991. In New South Wales, we look at the Crimes Sentencing Procedure Act 1999. And we look at the um, both of these acts statutorily lay out the purpose of a sentence. Okay. Um, so people as with the English language, this. as with the English language, in the judicial context, the purpose of a sentence is above all communication. 
Um, we look at the concept of deterrence and the concept of, in some jurisdictions, denunciation. Um, when we look at the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act, uh, we refer to Section 3A, which is Purposes of Sentencing. And I'm going to refer to the New South Wales Act from here, because again, it's what I'm familiar with. The purposes of sentencing for an offender are to ensure the offender is adequately punished, to prevent crime by deterring the offender and other persons from committing similar offences, so that's specific and general deterrence, which we'll cover in a moment, to protect the community from the offender, which is what you said, Kyle, to promote rehabilitation of the offender, again, Kyle, you, you got that one right on the head, to make the offender accountable for his or her actions, hmm. to denounce the conduct of the offender, and to recognize the harm done to the victim of the crime and the community. Oh, okay. So we have that all there laid out, black and white. We want to make sure that the criminal doesn't do it again. We want to make sure no one else does that. We yeah, want to make sure completely... the community is kept safe. And we want to send a clear message that this is a crime and the community does not accept it. Yeah, and, and recognise the damage that has been done. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I completely just didn't think about that. Um, yeah, interesting. Didn't think about the, you know, I guess the victims in the situation and how, um, you know, how the, the, well, punishments and, you know, why we imprison people is in part about well, about justice for them. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, I the community about? needs to feel that justice has been done. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when we look at deterrence, um, you'll remember that I mentioned specific and general deterrence. Most uh, legal studies courses will deal with general deterrence first and specific deterrence second. The mm -hmm. law records specific deterrence first and general deterrence second, so that's the order in which I'm going to handle it. Specific deterrence means we want to make this experience such that the next time you have an opportunity to commit an offence, you think back to this and you decide that you don't want to go through this again. The unfortunate reality is that many right. people who go to jail become better criminals because they are uh, in close contact with other criminals. They learn from each other. Um, they may move to bigger and more impressive crimes. Um, but again, well, on on that, I think you know. I guess something to, to throw out there. I think I think that's a failing of the um, a failing of the prison system itself to properly. Yeah, the custodial system is not people. set up for rehabilitation. Yes, well, see, that that I think needs to change. I think we need to set it up more for rehabilitation and just to give other people the the opportunity to um, explore and develop, um, for lack of a better term, just other, other doors of life. You know, like we need to, we need to give them the, the tools to open, to open doors to other prospects, other avenues for them I, to take. I have visited for stuff. legal purposes and yeah, I visited for legal purposes and to visit inmates multiple prisons in New South Wales and mm -hmm. let me tell you they're depressing places. I'm not advocating for painting all the walls pink um, I am however no, acknowledging no, that, that uh, prisons do seem prisons do seem to be more focused on providing the punishment and less the opportunity. And mm. I think in large part that's because setting up for rehabilitation is expensive and it's not something that society necessarily likes to invest in. If you propose well, like building a nice a nice uh uni satellite campus and job center on a prison, then you will hear some angry radio person say, Oh, our tax dollars are paying for making these criminals comfortable. Why is that something we're doing? Well, then I ask the question, and, which one is more expensive? These people, like, if you think if you think about it, what's more expensive? These people, after they have, you know, quote-unquote, paid their debt to society or served their sentence, them damaging society more through their crime 
or the costs of rehabilitating them so that they are not damaging but rather benefiting society. Which of those is I'd more argue expensive? that rehabilitation is an investment. And like exactly. any investment, like university. if you put in the initial investment, you do see returns. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and I'd say the, the investment here is actually greater than than with most standard education. Um, uh, what's the word? Campuses or, or institutions? That's the yep. word. With most standard education institutions, you know, you're just, uh, you're taking, you know, essentially like a, almost like a blank slate at least in these terms, and you're, you know, give, giving them a path forward. In this, you're taking somebody who is, you know, a darkened slate, and you're, you're, you're not just cleaning it. Uh, you're not, you're not just providing them, you know, I guess color, but you're cleaning them first. You're doing a, you're doing more with probably the same resources. Um, therefore, giving society an even greater benefit. You're reducing the damage that they cause, perhaps to zero, and creating benefit where there previously was none. So, you know, to anyone yeah, who and would say, while that... to anyone who would say, why would we spend our tax dollars on that? I'd say it's more expensive not why to. Why wouldn't you? Even if you're just looking, yeah, why wouldn't you? You have every benefit, you know, even more benefits than usual, no downsides. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that logic. Um, again, yeah, I'm just maybe. saying that this is part of the reason why it hasn't happened is because it's very easy to to stir up community outrage and it can be hard oh. to summon the political will to rehabilitate people. Hell, That's we see that in politics. mental health. We see that in the physical health care oh, system. Yeah. We we don't we don't put enough effort into making people who are sick healthy. Why the hell are we expecting anyone to have compassion for convicted criminals? Well. I mean, you ask, sorry. you ask, you ask I, why. Mm. I guess you're asking rather ironically there, but you know, my mind's already given an answer, and that's well because we should do better because it's right. You know, we should be doing Damn better straight. on all these fronts. And in this, I think that playing politics with any of those, let alone with you know people who have really lost their way in society, and with people who currently do damage but could be a benefit to society, I think that. You know, to play politics with that, with that potential there, and destroy that potential mm. through the playing of politics. I think that is a deeper wrong than most people who are in prison have done, because that is that is that is okay, sacrificing so... potential on the altar of political expedience. That is speaking like, of that potential. Lane... <laughs> yeah. I, I do need to segue to general deterrence before we run out of time, because you are quite right. About are, the rehabilitation of there. prisoners, actually, and you we're are running out, of, running out of time right now. So I, I guess real quick, real quick, general deterrence. Well, the other thing is general deterrence. It's the like we've spoken about making this unpleasant enough that people don't want to do more crimes. Um, hmm. But the idea of deterrence, general deterrence, and denunciation, to my mind, go hand in hand. The denunciation component of sentencing is the court saying that. Uh, we as the court represent the community. We have been entrusted to represent the community. The community finds your behavior to be unacceptable. Um, um, Christ, I'm reminded of the end of Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, which is a a dark, bloody book, um, and it has many flaws, but it is still worth reading. Um, the other... But the point of denunciation also has to be communicating to the general public that again, this is not something the community considers acceptable. And ultimately, when we look at general deterrence, um, when we say, okay, uh, you got drunk and you sped through a school zone and you hit three children, and this court is finding that you are going to jail for 18 years for aggravated vehicular manslaughter, what we are saying to the general community is, and if you do it, if you even think about it, motherfucker, we're coming for you as well. We are not only saying, if you do this again, that's another 18, of, 18 years of your life down the shitter. We are saying to everyone in the community that this is a standard to which we are holding every member of the community. And if you run afoul of it, we will punish you as well. And mm -hmm. that may make the member of the general public who has a drinking problem 
um, think twice before getting behind the wheel and mm. potentially causing far more harm. So general deterrence is about preventing future harm to the community by uh, others who may commit a similar offence. Yeah, by, by essentially, you know, in, a, in the nicest possible way, making an example out of that, out of that terrible situation. Setting the example of, you know, this is, this is what happens when you do the wrong thing. You know, essentially providing yes. people an example of the wrong thing so that they can avoid it. Now, the only problem with this, and I, I did hint at this earlier, and I'll make it damn quick, is quick, that right, we're there is now. some evidence to suggest that harsher penalties do not actually deter would-be criminals. There is some well, evidence to suggest that harsher penalties don't actually have the desired effect. But at yeah. the same time, the community's need to see justice done means mm -hmm. that we quietly look the other way at that evidence. Yeah. Uh, and well, on, I'm hopeful that, note, that as a country also... we can move forward on that. Yeah, on that note, I would also bring up uh, an example which I was I was once told about, which is um, you don't want to cut a, a man's hand off for stealing because then he will murder any of the witnesses. Yes. That is also a, a factor to be considered. Unfortunately, we can't discuss that in more detail because we are now running over time. But thank you for watching, and uh, and we'll catch you later. I think we've covered enough about prison and why we do or don't go there. Oh, shit, we didn't cover not going to prison. Can we record a 10-minute short after this just uh, for not going to prison? Okay, maybe, probably. Please. See you in the next Let's episode. Do another recording quickly. It'll be a bonus. See ya. Yeah.